now it's working everything is working properly now or looks like it um hello gian how's it going good thanks francis how are you i'm good too um good. welcome to the uh part two of the podcast of uh concussion um we will be talking about some uh, topics uh, about the concussion so if you guys didn't had a chance to watch uh the part one uh, it was two weeks ago so you can find it on youtube um and uh you can find like the first part so we talked about giving what is a definition and 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 the the, the first thing to know how to uh, diagnose not diagnose but to know if you have a concussion so what to do and all that today on part two we will be talking about uh prevention and what to do access to care so that's uh pretty much what we're going to talk today now don't miss next at uh, the next podcast because uh concussion there's three parts uh part one two and three we are doing the part two today part three will be with captain ryan carey who's uh, retired from the Canadian armed forces and he's also uh, a former player of the cfl Uh, the Canadian Football League. So uh, he works for the Canadian Con uh, Concussion Foundation and he will be doing a podcast with us uh, on Demio in two weeks. So that's going to be the 6th of August. Um, it's going to be at three o'clock on uh, Demio and uh, three o'clock mountain uh, time zone. If you are from the east, uh, like Ottawa, it's going to be uh, two hours Uh, further than that so it's going to be 5 p.m instead of 3 p.m um and um just to give you a, a heads up ryan carey played for five years in the cfl from 1994 to 1998 and uh he's um he also joined the military um before he, i think he was with the rcr i'm not sure but i think he was with the rcr so that's an infantry unit um with he was an officer so obviously so he will talk a lot about uh a concussion with sports athletes and also the military so it, it looks pretty much a really exciting uh podcast so guys don't miss that uh, just register on demio uh to uh participate live obviously if you cannot be here on demio uh that's not a problem we're just going to be uh putting the podcast right after on youtube so you can watch it later if you can't make it at three uh three uh, o'clock alberta time or five uh, five o'clock easter time so that's uh that's the promo for the next podcast um and um this week uh it's part two on concussion concussion so as we mentioned two weeks ago in part one A concussion is a type of traumatic brain injury, so you will probably also uh, hear a lot of TBI. Um, we need to keep in mind that the brain is the most complex part of, of, of the body. Uh, since it's surrounded by a bony shell and a protective fluid, uh, the brain is well protected. Uh, but it's also the most fragile organ in the body. The makeup of the brain Uh, makes it vulnerable in some situation. For as instance, when uh, when your head is shaken rapidly or aggressively, like a whiplash, the brain will be compressed inside the cranial cavity because it has nowhere else to go. This is why a whiplash or blasts uh, may cause a, a TBI. And we're going to be using TBI uh, in this podcast just to make it shorter. Um, so if the, com the impact is high, the brain may have a contusion similar to a bruise, which will create swelling um, also. So the problem with uh, the brain when uh, there is swelling, since it's inside the cranial or the skull, um, the brain wants to expand and it cannot expand because there's nowhere else to go and it, it's just going to compress itself and it's going to compress his blood supply itself so that's why it's a very complex uh, situation and you want to uh, prevent that from happening when you do have some swelling or even internal bleeding in your brain um, 
although this sounds very intense, we may not see any clear physical change from before to after the impact on the person. So this is why it's very important to see uh, when you, you, you suspect that you have a concussion to not play with it or saying that you're okay. Uh, it's, it's always good to uh, go to the hospital. But for example, if you're in a car accident, the EMT will automatically think that you do have a concussion and they will do the necessary procedure to take uh, to take you to the hospital for further testing. So uh, it did happen to my life. I did have a car accident and um, the, the EMT, when they arrived, they put me in a cocoon. Uh, so it's a big balloon that will envelop you to uh, prevent you from moving. Uh, uh, because obviously they don't know if you do have a spinal injury. And uh, when they brought me to the hospital, uh, they checked uh, everything. They checked my brain if they if I did have a concussion. So that's an automatic uh, response from them. Um, um, also, I just want to don't miss, uh, miss anything that I've uh, said. Uh, but when you're playing sports or even when you're in the military doing an, a military exercise, we don't always think at the same way as a health professional. So we might be uh, thinking that we do have a, a concussion or not. And uh, we just like going to take a title or even like uh, just say that we're going to go for sleep and uh, just do a nap and probably everything will go away. Um, and that could be our first response on a real concussion, which it's not the optimal thing to do when we do have a concussion. So uh, a TBI or a concussion may continue to deteriorate your brain function for several hours or even days after the accident. I say accident, but sometimes it's not even an accident. Um, a good example would be uh, when you're uh, shooting a big rifle um like a, a a gustav uh in the military so that's like a really big bazooka an anti-tank rifle uh the shock wave that this creates might create a tbi and you will feel fine before or even after uh you've shot a couple bullets so it's not an accident but you have to consider these kind of stuff as a potential uh, tbi um so because the brain is made of tissue and a different uh, of different densities during the impact this uh, these tissue move at a different rate which will make them shear and compress uh, each other creating a minor damage the brain cell or neuron are injured uh, by axonal shearing brain damage can still occur for hours or like i said even days after the initial uh, initial injury. So this is why we want to keep monitoring the injured person to see if the condition is deteriorate, deteriorating. If signs or symptoms are showing up days after the initial injury, it's a good idea to see a doctor if you didn't do it already uh, from the start. I'll show you a picture. Let me just open that. There you go. Um, I'm really sorry if you uh, are heart sensitive. <laughs> I forgot to uh, mention that before showing the... Oh, you guys don't see the pictures. Yeah, I got to share my screen. Share my screen. The first one. There you go. So if you're heart sensitive, uh, just don't really look at that picture. But uh, this is a brain. Uh, can you see it on uh, Gian on your side? Yep. Okay. So as you, I, as you can see on these uh, pictures, the first one that I'm showing you right now, you can see that there is a big difference between a normal brain and uh, the brain of a boxer. That's a, a professional. Well, it's a, the brain of a boxer who uh, did a lot of competition. Uh, you can see that in size, and I didn't really change anything, but in size, there's a big difference. So a brain of a boxer is smaller. And you can also see some different uh, color on the brain. Um, so the dark spots are abnormal protein, which are toxic to the brain. Also, uh, you can see that these areas are permanent damage. Um, also, uh, on the other picture that I'll show you right now, um, 
this picture, you can see different kind of a chain, a stage of uh, pugilistic dementia. Um, and we see that the, the, the red circle right here um, shows that it's uh, the same thing, like it's a dark spot. And it, uh, um, it indicates this part is very important for your brain. It indicates your emotions. So actually, emotions. So actually it, uh, it uh, plays with your emotions. So actually, if this part is affected, you may have some emotions problem um, also. So damage in this part uh, of the brain can result in personally change mood swings and depression or even suicide. So that's why there's uh, some stuff that uh, there are some cause that we're saying that probably if you do have a TBI, CTE or even um, uh, concussion, uh, it might change your personality in the future. And that's why you might see it in some uh, military or even uh, former athletes or even like active athletes. Um, so uh, the most important part of this um, to know as today is there is no cure. So there is no way to reverse the damage once it has a cured. So we need to, uh, to be careful with uh, preventing uh, concussions. Um, so Gian, what are the steps for management of a concussions? So um, we talk about the five R's. So reevaluate, rest, recovery, return to work, school, or sport, um, and rehabilitate. So um, in terms of step one, which is reevaluate, we typically re recommend a follow-up medical evaluation. So like we talked about last time, we have the, con the CRT, the con concussion recognition tool that's designed for lay people. So for instance, coaches or, or families, um, when, there's, when there's an incident or a suspected concussion, if you suspect a concussion based on, on the CRT-5, um, typically um, we recommend a reevaluation by a healthcare professional who will do a an examination called the SCAT-5 um, in addition to a clinical exam. So that clinical exam entails um, cognitive testing as well as the evaluation of coordination, balance, neurological function, and just the symptoms in general. And, and the goal of this um, step of reevaluation is to rule out more serious pathology. Again, if their condi condition has deteriorated and there were no red flags at the time that the CRT-5 was, was carried out, like we talked about in the last podcast, that will be picked up um, if, if things have changed. And um, so again, the, the main purpose is just just to rule out anything that could possibly be more sinister. Um, so after reevaluation, we recommend for sure rest. So uh, 24 to 48 hours of relative rest is the recommendation um, currently, and that includes both cognitive and physical rest. So we basically we want to give the brain a break. That also involves time away from screens, we, with the stimulation of any sort. So visual stimulation, audio, auditory stimulation. We want to minimize that just to give the brain a cooling off period and to allow it to rest. There is more research required as to the exact amount and duration of rest, but typically again 24 to 48 hours is the recommendation currently. And then we gradually reintroduce activities of daily living. So just simple things to start with, things like having a shower, you know, maybe doing some basic cleaning, that kind of thing, provided that these things do not increase symptoms. So the rationale for the rest phase is we want to ease discomfort to help folks manage the symptoms. And we also want to um, decrease the demands on the healing brain to allow it to heal. Same as if you injured your knee, really, you wouldn't go running on it. You need to, to go through that rest period to give it the best chance of a good recovery. So leading into that, the next stage is recovery. So the research shows that most adults will recover uh, within 10 to 14 days after the initial injury. And most children and youth will recover within the first four weeks. So typically speaking, patients can return to walking and cycling low impact um, activities at sub-symptomatic thresholds after 48 hours. So that's the, the typical um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the typical response. So it's important to remember there is not a single test to measure recovery. It's a very multifaceted thing. Um, that we used to really get caught in the trap, um, and I, I, that could be quite quite debilitating for folks of, you know, not doing anything that 
pr um, produce their symptoms. And I, I knew of some cases of some young people who hadn't been to school, like 13, 14 years old, and they hadn't been to school, had been off their sports and all activities for 18 months. And so we can't get stuck in rest. That's also a concern. But that initial 24 to 48 hours, definitely rest. And then after that, it's about progressive, gradual reintroduction of activities for folks. So the next thing we'll talk about is return to school or return to work. So basically returning to activities that make demands of the cognitive part of the brain. So we want to gradually reintroduce these things using, again, the subsymptomatic threshold principle. And we look for a gradual stepwise strategy of increasing cognitive demands. This really can require, particularly in the case of a return to school, communication between the family, the school, or the employer, in the case of a working person, as well as the healthcare provider. So everyone's expectations are known and um, reasonable. So Francis, can I get you please to go through the return to school strategy with us? I think you had some information on that. Yes. I think um, we have it on the screen too. Uh, yeah, we do. <laughs> Return to sport. Return Sorry. To school. Yeah. Well, I think that's the one you want us to show. So I'm going to share the screen and you're going to tell me if that's the one you want us to show. Um, this one? Yep, that looks good. Okay. So we do like that document. Um, I'll share it with you guys after. There is a lot of information. There we it, go. But, okay. uh, yeah. But what's important it... here? Um, I don't see the steps, but I'll uh, talk to, uh, about the steps and uh, you will probably find it on that document. But uh, what I mean okay. about uh, the steps, the step one, um, there's four steps. It's the same thing for return to sports, but we'll talk about that after. Um, the, uh, the return, uh, the step one is you have to start with light mental activity. So, for example, reading for 15 minutes every couple of times per day or a couple hours. Um, you still have to limit your screen time. Screen time, as Jian already mentioned, uh, it's uh, something that will probably provoke uh, some some headaches or symptoms. But also, the blue light of the of this of the screen will probably not help you. So when we're saying screen time, it's not only the computer, but it's also texting, com uh, video games, anything that has a screen. Uh, you want to limit that. So that's going to be your step one. The step two is return to class. So you can uh, start returning to class uh, to some specific uh, class um, itself. So you don't need to return full time at school uh, to start. You can just uh, select the classes that will um, will help you to not have symptoms. For example, if you feel all right in the morning and you prefer going uh, in the morning classes, that's all right. Uh, if it's more in the afternoon, that's going to be more in the afternoon. That's the step two. So you got to be, um, you're going to class, but the, you're you're selecting the class itself, and it may not be uh, a full day that you're going to do. Um, every time, uh, I just want to uh, re-mention it, but every time you want to step, uh, move from a further step, so from step one to step two, or step three or four, you have to be symptom free. So as uh, Gian already mentioned, step uh, two, uh, what you can do uh, in class also is you want to uh, be uh, not be distracted by all your your classmate. Um, so you can sit in front of the class so you won't see any distraction of everybody sitting in front of you. Um, so that would be a really good thing to do. And also, uh, you don't want to really uh, take notes. Uh, you just want to focus uh, on the class and see if you're capable of keeping your attention to what's happening in class. So you can ask one of your uh, friends or your, your classmate to take notes for you. That would be in the step two. You can pay, uh, the goal is to pay attention and to participate during class. So if there's any quiz or anything that uh, the, the teacher asks questions or stuff like that, you want to be uh, part uh, of that class. You don't want uh, to not really participate during that time. So that will be what you will be evaluating during that time. Uh, try to avoid other activities that will increase the symptoms. Like obviously we already mentioned the screen time. So that would be the, um, 
the, the step two also work uh, on short assignments so don't work on really big tasks or doing like a, a big exam if that's possible if you're in step two uh, it may not help you the step three when you're going to start this step it's you want to increase your academic workload so you're going to return to more classes beginning to take your own notes uh, during the class work on major assignments uh, and doing tests or even projects so this is going to be step three step four will be returning to normal academic activities so you did evaluate that you're capable of uh, doing everything normally with no symptoms so you can go to to return to uh, your full schedule as normal and that's all that's only the return to school one so Jan yeah, do you want sure. us to so I think sure I think it's important oh, one one good point I think is that the return to sport and the return to school strategies need to be done simultaneously or the return to school should precede the return to sport. We don't want kids going back to sports before they go back to school. And I think the reasons for that are pretty self-explanatory. Um, so then in terms, we talked about uh, the return to school strategy. Um, and we also, uh, so that again is used for cognitive recovery. And then there's also the return to uh, sport strategy, which, which we use um, for physical recovery. So um, I think Francis, you were gonna go through the steps of the return to sport strategy as well yes on that one i do have the steps of uh, what you were talking about just let me show you there you go so these are there the steps um of uh, return to physical activity on this document they were having uh six stages um uh, the way i i talk about it it's you're gonna see other documents like this document is from parachute canada is it canada um, but it's uh, from the parachute um, sports itself. So uh, you will see uh, other documents that says uh, three steps or three stages, uh, uh, four stages, sorry, not three. And it's basically the same thing. It's only like the first one, like for example, step one or stage one, it's exactly what Jian told you uh, prior of talking uh, of steps or stages. So rest for 24 to 48 hours before doing anything and all that. So they just included these uh, steps before, which you will probably not see in other documents. But um, yeah, so uh, the step one um, what, what you need to do uh, to know is for physical activity, since you're going to increase your cardiovascular uh, system or also your muscular system, um, you want to always be safe. So you want to always progress a bit at a time. So you don't want to go back to what you were doing before. And uh, what's really important here, it's you are not testing your fitness, you are testing your brain. So you want to see if your brain is capable of uh, doing the, the, the activity that you're doing right now without any symptoms. So this is very important why I, I uh, make a lot of emphasis on that because people think that, oh, I can run for 20 minutes with no problem at uh, 12 kilometers per hour. That's not a problem for me. Yes, but that's your fitness. That's not your brain. So if you do have a symptom while running, you might put yourself in some risk or uh, another injury. So you want to always be safe. So we're testing the brain. We're not testing your fitness and uh, not at this time. So um, you can look at the, 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 the page here, but I'll go with the steps that I have in my notes. So the step one is usually like cardio. On this one, you, it's going to be in step two. Um, and it's, for example, being able to run for a maximum of 20 minutes. Um, and that's that's pretty much what, what it is for step one. So like cardio, that's pretty much. And do it on the safe zone. So a uh, good thing is don't do it on the treadmill. Because if you do have dizziness and you're running on a treadmill, uh, the treadmill will not know that you're having dizziness and you're not feeling well. And uh, you may not be able to stop the treadmill. So he will just continue rolling and with no problem. And it might uh, put you into uh, an injury situation. I'm not saying it's at risk. I'm just saying like if you don't feel comfortable with a treadmill, I would not recommend you to, uh, to focus on the treadmill. Um, just run outside. That's good because you can stop at any time. And uh, that, that can be a good way to evaluate your uh, cardio, your stage one. 
the stage two usually is sports specific drills. So for a duration of 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and in this part, for example, if you're playing football or hockey or these kind of contact sports, there is no contact. So you, uh, no contact at all, no body check, nothing uh, during the stage two. So actually athletes shouldn't be doing the drills with the team also. They should be uh, doing the drills separately because like we said, uh, you're not evaluating, uh, evaluating your, capaci your capacity of doing the drill with the team. You're evaluating your brain if you do have symptoms during these drills. So the good thing is to do drills that you're uh, comfortable with, that you, uh, you've done, not do new drills. You can, but uh, it might create some, uh, some headaches during that time. So if uh, you're having new stuff, it will activate your brain. And if you're doing some stuff that you're used to, you may uh, be just... Do, doing it as an automatic thing and it will probably uh, less solicitate your brain so you just want to uh, this is what you want to do in uh, the stage two so keep in mind there is no contact during uh, this stage stage three is um, the return to full practice with the team so this is when you're going to return uh, uh, if I take for example hockey uh, if you play with a hockey team you want to return with the team doing some drills with the team in a full practice if it's possible during that practice or during the that stage you will wear a penny uh, usually they're going to put a red penny over your jersey um, and that will apply to every sports because you have uh, the restriction of having no contact. So you just want to go with the team and see if you're capable of keeping the practice, the level of intensity. And if there's new drills, new stuff, that's all right too. Um, you want to evaluate the capacity of, of following this practice with no symptoms, but you still have no, uh, no contact. So a red penny is always good. It's not for you. It's more for your teammates because when you're doing a drill, sometimes they will forget that you're recovering from a concussion and uh, they will probably do a body check or something like that in the practice. So they want to be safe and not create anything like this. The step four will be um, the the time that you, you will release the, the penny. So you will not wear any penny. You will be dressed uh, exactly like your teammates and you will do a normal practice with the teammates. So this is where you have, you will have no restrictions um, during this uh, this stage. Uh, so on this port, uh, this uh, document here, you're going to be at stage five. So full contact practice following clearance by a doctor. That's always good to always have a follow up. And obviously, if you do have a diagnostic from a doctor, they will uh, need a follow up anyway. So that um, that's a good thing to uh, to follow. So that would be the stage four. Um, yeah. So Gian, anything to add? So I just thought we could do like a summary. So basically return to sport strategy, it's gradual and stepwise. Um, each step takes 24 hours because we want to see if there is a delayed return of symptoms. So if you do really, really well, phase two, you don't go on to phase three at the end of the same practice. You have to wait 24 hours before you can go on to the next step. Um, it should take, as because we are putting 24 hours at each step, it should take a minimum of one week to complete the return to sports strategy. So if everything's going well, best case scenario is you're back in action full stop in a week. That would be the minimum. Um, if symptoms recur, we advise people to take a step back to the previous step. And it's also important to remember that medical clearance is required prior to step five or reintroduction of activities that put players at risk of concussion. So the contact portion of their activity. So Francis, as an athlete yourself and an exercise physiologist, and I know you have a lot of experience working with teams, do you have any other return to sport strategies for people who have suffered concussions? Yeah, there's one thing that um, the documents will not show and uh, will probably not mention. It's the uh, return to competition. So we're not talking about return to sports, but more return to competition. So that's one thing that it's um, uh, that I can give more de uh, details on that. Um, there is a big difference between a competition and a practice. So when you do practice with your teammates uh, during a practice, you will probably not see 
um, the level of intensity that you will probably normally see when you're going to uh, have a competition. So when you have an adversity, another team who wants to, uh, to basically um, compete against you, they will probably uh, elevate the intensity to a level that you will probably have some symptoms or have a recurrence of your uh, injury. So what you want to do is also as a coach or as a teammate, uh, as a player, sorry, when you return to competition, if your coach is not playing you, uh, if I take, for example, hockey again, and you're forward, um, if uh, they like you're usually you're used to play 25 minutes to 30 minutes per game um, you, of ice time, they might reduce it to probably 10 minutes to 15 minutes per game of ice time. And this is uh, typically normal because they want to know, they want to see if the competition level doesn't have or do, does not create any symptoms. Um, and this is very important. Um, so this is also a, a, a progression. So you have to keep uh, a progress yourself, like go bit by bit uh, during the game because you want to have a return to a safe zone while uh, competing against other people. Now, I know some people may not like what we're saying right now because they want to return as fast as possible to the competition and uh, sometimes a concussion will occur uh, to a playoff or close to a tournament or something like that or you're going to have some scouts in the stands of watching and watching you specifically but this is very important because even if a scout uh like watch you playing with a concussion that is not fully recovered uh, and you do have some symptoms in, on the ice, you're just going to like end your career uh, faster than you think. So you want to be safe. And uh, if you're a hockey fan, you will probably take Sidney Crosby as a good example. Um, but obviously he was like a really good guy, a good player in the, in the junior. Everybody knew him before even he was drafted. But the main goal here is uh, he did t- took a year off uh, of season just to fix his concussion and come back fully healthy and uh, even if his team depended on him so that's a good example for if you're a goaltender it might be different because obviously you're gonna uh, goaltend a full game uh, but you're gonna work period by period so if you do a first period you don't have any symptoms and you're feeling great well that's good you tell it to the coach to your head coach and then the head coach will keep you in the net for the second period and if you do have some symptoms during the second period um well you will uh sit for the third one so it's a way to be progressive and make sure that you're 100 percent ready for the competition level not the sports itself because you did evaluate yourself uh for uh the the sport but not the competition so this is my uh advice for people who wants to this is not what you see in the stages it's going to be the last stage of the document we showed you was stage six but that would be my recommendation in the stage six um gian are there any factors that delay a return to normal activities Hmm. so what the research shows is that there are a few Um, So one is a prior history of concussion, and that's particularly relevant if the prior concussions have been within a short time frame, if you haven't had a full recovery after, or repeat concussions that occur with a decreasing threshold of traumatic force. So if you're just getting concussed more and more easily, that's a sign that your recovery could be more protracted. Um, And also previous concussions that have had a poor recovery or have taken a really long time, that often predicts that future concussions will do the same or perhaps even worse. Um, Pre-existing conditions can also uh, cause delayed or lead to a delayed recovery. So that includes things like migraines, mental health problems, or learning disorders. Some of those folks have have a more difficult time bouncing back from a concussion. The use of psychoactive medication, also as well as anticoagulant or blood thinners, those those are two predictors of of a longer recovery. Also, the nature of the activity or the sport that is considered to be be returning to. So, for instance, if there is a very high risk of concussion in the sport or if it involves intentional hits to the head, so things like football, boxing, that kind of thing, um, a longer recovery period is definitely suggested for those folks. Um, generally speaking, any doubt regarding the information obtained during an assessment 
resulting from external or self-imposed pressure to return to sport, those folks, we like to back them off a little bit and make sure they're really safe because unfortunately they're, they're poor historians and we can't necessarily believe that the symptoms they report are true. So sometimes we will back those people off. And that's one of the challenges with concussion. We don't have a lot of objective tests that, um, you know, there's no blood test, for instance, at this point in time to indicate that there is a concussion. So we re rely a lot on self-reporting. And unfortunately, sometimes self-reporting can be um, not the most reliable. So if there is doubt that way, sometimes we'll, we'll back things off a little bit and make these folks take a little bit longer just to make sure they really are symptom-free. So Francis, in follow-up to that, do you have any tips for dealing with the challenge of athletes who aren't reporting symptoms because they want to re return to play faster than they really truly ought to? Yes, uh, the good thing about that is uh, to always focus on a positive messaging. So you don't want to put like a, a wrong culture inside the sports itself. Um, you want to make sure that the athlete knows the most uh, that most people have very good outcomes on post concussion and they will return to play. Actually, uh, uh, the return to play will be actually faster if it's reported sooner. Um, and there is an appropriate uh, management, early management on it. So um, in your team, inside your, your locker, even as a coach, you can talk about that just to, just to incorporate a positive team culture in there and uh, so that the athletes does not feel any pressure to avoid reporting any concussion or actually try to fake or uh, try to fake their recovery to return faster to play. So um it's it's very important uh, to seek care when you do have symptoms don't skip any steps uh, skipping any steps does not really accelerate the recovery it will just deteriorate uh, deteriorate the, the the recovery so you got to be careful with that so gian mm -hmm. we said earlier that most adults uh, recover uh, in the initial 10 to 14 days and most children in the initial four weeks what about those who don't? So yeah, that's for sure a good point. So 20 to 30% of concussion sufferers um, will have persist persistent symptoms post-concussion. So that doesn't mean forever, but it certainly means beyond those time frames, beyond the 10 to 14 days for adults and beyond for uh, younger people. So, what the common persistent symptoms tend to be are headache or neck pain. That's one of the, probably the, the major one is headache. Um, fatigue and exercise intolerance is another one. Um, dizziness and balance disturbance. Difficulty with vision. Sensitivity to light and noise. Uh, difficulty with concentration and remembering. Um, anxiety, depression, increased emotional ability, and anger. So again, we can see some personality changes, and that's what Francis was indicating when he was showing those pictures. Um, sleep disturbance is another common one, as well as just kind of a generally not feeling right, just people feeling off. So those are the persistent symptoms that 20 to 30 percent of people are, are left with after concussion. So some of the factors that will predict who these folks are going to be are the severity of the acute and subacute symptoms. So people who have really, really severe symptoms in the acute stage and are really not functioning very well, they tend to, uh, to be among that 20 to 30%. As well as folks who have headaches and depression in the subacute phase, they tend to have a, a challenge, more challenging recovery. Um, also a history of mental health problems uh, predating the concussion can also preclude those individuals to a, a more challenging recovery. So some of the causes of persistent symptoms are unresolved concussion, but that's not the only one. So some of the causes, again, can be that the concussion still needs, the, the individual still needs to recover from the concussion, but there are also individuals with headache syndromes underlying underlying the, the, their problem. So pre-existing migraine, that type of thing. If there was a neck injury associated with the concussion, um, dysfunction of the vestibular system, so that's your balance system. Um, dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, sleep disorders, or underlying anxiety or depression. And those people, those, those are the things that cause the persistent symptoms. So it's not always the concussion. Sometimes it, there's associated things that really put a magnifying glass on the concussion symptoms. So in terms of treating these individuals, we have a couple of options, often integrating both is ideal. So we can look at targeted rehab. So that, that would be usually 
biophysiotherapist, occupational therapist, that type of thing. So what we're looking at with those programs are symptom limited, low level aerobic exercise, which is gradually progressed. Um, we can also look at individualized physiotherapy, which includes treatment of the neck as well as the vestibular system. So very commonly, the incident that caused the concussion, whether it's a whiplash or what have you, can also cause musculoskeletal injuries. And it can be very hard to bang the head around without affecting the, the cervical spine. So we also have to rule out musculoskeletal problems. So things like injury to the neck, injury to the jaw, if there was a blow, that can often be a problem. Uh, and those injuries often need to be addressed as well, because interestingly enough, both jaw issues and neck problems can cause dizziness, can cause headache, that kind of thing. So again, that needs to be ruled out and, and addressed. Um, in order to have adequate balance and coordination, the brain integrates information from our necks, so the position sense of our necks, also our eyes and our inner ears. So all of that information is taken in by the brain and that helps us maintain our balance and equilibrium. So problems with any of those areas, so whether it's the neck, whether it's the eyes, the visual system, or the inner ear, can, it can make the brain very difficult to interpret. And this can result in disequilibrium and balance and organ and um, in coordination. And all of those things can cause fatigue. You imagine if, if just walking in a crowded place takes all of your concentration to stay upright, that's going to be very exhausting for you because it's something that your peers can do without having to think about it. It's something you could probably do pre-injury without having to think about it. So when simple day-to-day -day tasks are very difficult for your brain to integrate, even little things can become very fatiguing. So in addition to targeted rehab, we also, and unfortunately living rurally as we do in Wainwright, we don't necessarily have these um, things to our, at our disposal, but um, multidisciplinary team approaches to the management of concussion can be very beneficial as well. So in, in these types of situations, we look for a collaborative approach to treatment. So this will involve mental health professionals, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, perhaps even dietitians, medical doctors, nurses, just to do a very multifaceted approach, something very holistic, looking at all of the, um, the components um, that have been affected by the by the, the concussion. So the aim of our assessments with these folks when we do a post-concussion ass assessment is to identify the cause of the ongoing symptoms. So like I said before, it's not always the concussion. Sometimes there's other stuff going on as well that also needs to be addressed to have the best recovery from the concussion. So as a result of that, the assessment must be really broad and comprehensive. So first of all, we look at um, a musculoskeletal exam of the neck and jaw. So we're looking at movement, we're looking at tenderness, strength, those types of things. Um, we also look, we assess balance. We also look for eye movement and vision, um, cognitive function, so memory, processing, reaction time, that type of thing. And then again, like I said before, we look at a graduated aerobic exercise testing um, for assessment of uh, exercise tolerance. And some of these folks, um, the, the really more involved people who aren't functioning very well within the timeframes that are expected, they may require formal neuropsych testing. Um, in terms of treatment, um, particularly for post-concussion headache, um, but really most of the symptoms uh, that can linger after concussion. The goal is non-pharmacological non symptom management. And, and the reason that we really want to stay away from the medication, um, Francis is going to talk about, about that a little bit later, but one of the big limitations um, of medication is rebound headaches. So people take these medications and they're doing pretty well and they go off of them and is the headache that results a result of again, a rebound headache from not taking the medication, or is it from the concussion itself? So sometimes the waters can get a little bit muddied when people become too reliant on medication. So one of the major treatments um, for concussion patients is education. So we need to talk to these folks about their sleep schedule, about their sleep hygiene. The brain needs to recover, and it does that through rest. So talking about 
rest principles can be really, really important. Um, we also need to talk to them about regular meals, regular exercise that's safe for them, as well as hydration. So some basic principles that are really, really important. They seem small, but they're actually really big in terms of the um, potential they have to help matters. So we also need to look at um, self-regulation. So things like mindfulness, having a quiet place to go to so the brain isn't so overwhelmed by sensory stimuli, deep breathing, stretching, the importance of getting fresh air, just a way, again, teaching people ways to give their brains a break. We also talk um, a lot about pacing and planning of activities to limit fatigue and improve function. So we'll often go through with folks and have them make schedules, making sure that they have adequate breaks throughout their day, making sure on days when they have have to do activities that are going to be very draining and lots of mental stimulation, that that's all they have that falls under that bracket that day. And the rest of their activities might be a little less strenuous for their brains. So pacing and planning principles are really important things that we go over with post concussion clients. So some of the keys, um, just in terms of the persistent symptoms, um, they are often caused by coexisting pathologies. Um, the assessment must be comprehensive and broad to identify what these pathologies are. Um, a detailed multimodal assessment can often help drive the appropriate treatment. And a collaborative, multidisciplinary, holistic approach is often essential for best results. So one final point that I would like to make on my end, um, because I am a musculoskeletal therapist primarily, the risk of MSK or musculoskeletal injuries is significantly higher for athletes sustaining sport-related concussions at 3, 6, and 12 months following concussion. That's what the research shows us. So athletes really need to be informed of these risks so they can make educated decisions about their return to play. They need to know that, yes, we're saying that you are safe to do this, but there, there could be consequences down the line, perhaps to carry your ACL or something completely unrelated. But again, they should be informed of that so they can make an educated decision. So Francis, for your end, do you have any other recommendations? Yes, and just to add on what you just said right now, um, since I'm in the field and I, I see a lot of athletes getting concussed and coming back to play and all that, there is also... Um, like she's saying, the risk of injury is higher because you don't feel safe or you, you're not you're returning to play. But um, since you did have a concussion while playing this sport, you may not be as confident as you were before. So it's always good to test yourself before um, to feel that confidence that you had before before coming back to play or even the competition that we just talked earlier during that podcast. So this is why this is one of the reason why the concussions may create a new MSK injury three, six, or nine months after uh, you recovered and you return to play. It might be out of cause, but if you don't feel confident, um, there's no rush to uh, to come back early or too early uh, to competition um, just to injure yourself way more or having another injury over that on top of that. But um, the other thing that I can talk about is concussion uh, with drugs and alcohol. So we don't recommend uh, to uh, consume any alcohol while you're concussed, even if you don't have any symptoms. So the problem is not the alcohol itself. It will be uh, what it does to your brain. So alcohol may increase your symptoms. For example, if you do have a headache, it's just going to amplify your headaches, uh, your, your headache itself, or your nausea, or even dizziness, or all that. Um, if you don't have one, it might create one. Like if you don't feel that you have one and then you drink, you might have one. Uh, intoxicating yourself might also increase the chance of having another concussion or a TBI. So for example, if you drink, you might get drunk. And by being drunk, you may not have the stability or the um, uh, you might just fall on the ground and if you fall on the ground, you're just going to fall like a drunk person and you will create a whiplash or a blow to your head. So it's going to create another injury. So you're just putting yourself into a high risk of, uh, of uh, an another injury or um, just aggravating your situation. A concussion may, all, uh, may already affect your decision making and by intoxicating yourself with drugs or alcohol, you will just amplify this situation. So you will 
uh, increase the decision making, the, the lack of decision making that you will do. So uh, this is another reason why we don't recommend to consume any drugs or alcohol. And that goes for any kind of drugs, even if it's prescribed by a doctor, a physician. So it needs to be monitored by your physician. So if you you do have some medication that you're taking already and you do have uh, the concussion, we would recommend you to talk with your physician. And if it's not already done, just to monitor your, uh, your drug or your prescription. Um, but as today, uh, we know that uh, marijuana is illegal in Canada, so you don't need a prescription for that. So that's why we need to mention drugs and also alcohol. Be careful. Uh, just make sure that your brain is fully recovered before you uh, you go back to your normal activities before. Um, like we said, we can't really do a lot of uh, treatment. The brain needs uh, a time for itself to fix so uh, it's not by like you you follow the steps that we show you but it's just to help your brain to fix itself it's not a physical like physiotherapy exercise that we're going to do that will do um, a big difference for the brain it's all around the brain itself so make sure that you're recovering fully um, before re reintegrating your normal activity before uh, and there are some things that can be done, sorry, Francis, you know, we t I talked about the balance between the visual system, the inner ear and the, the neck. So sometimes, and I, I probably should have re relayed this a little bit better because some people aren't aware. So um, there are vision exercises that we can sometimes do and, and there are activities that we can do to help the brain reintegrate the function of those three areas. So that's part of that rehabilitation piece. It's really, really fascinating stuff actually. And um, yeah, so. That can facilitate doesn't i wouldn't say it necessarily helps the brain heal but it helps the brain function and uh, if you get to the stage where there are persistent symptoms again that's only going to be 20 to 30 percent of people most of them aren't going to need us in the later stages but if they do that's some of the things that we focus on is integration of the visual system the uh, somatosensory system and uh, the inner ear so yeah yeah it is um all right so that that's uh that's all we have for podcast for the part two um, the part three, we will talk about uh, more detailed stuff with Ryan Carey. So guys, don't miss it. It's going to be in two weeks. Uh, just uh, subscribe on Demio. If you don't have a chance to come on Demio and uh, watch that uh, podcast live with us, just um, just uh, uh, follow us on YouTube and you will see the, the, the results of that podcast on YouTube. So yeah, if you don't have any questions, uh, we will end that podcast right now. And the weekend awesome. enjoy the rest of the day. All right, guys. So see you in two weeks for the part three of this podcast. See you guys. Bye.